Daniel 9. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom. So now we've shifted to the Medo-Persian uh, reign. Darius the Mede had taken over Babylonian kingdom in the first year of Darius. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. That's from Jeremiah 25, 11. And it specifically mentions Nebuchadnezzar taking over, and it would be a 70-year period. So it doesn't seem like a big code to be breaking. It just is a matter of do you have the information available? You know, for us, we've got the Bible and it's available to everybody. But back then, it wasn't as available. So you would have to go back and look through it, see what you've missed when you looked at it before. And Daniel realized it was going to be a 70-year period. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong. So this is Daniel praying and fasting in sackcloth and ashes on behalf of the whole Jewish nation. And I'm sure the whole Jewish nation didn't feel the same as him, but he is still pleading kind of like a mediator for his, for his people. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our ancestors, and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far, and all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. So Daniel gives God the credit for scattering the people all over the world. So not only should we give God credit for good things in our life, but God is sovereign over all things, including the things that we don't like. So if anything bad happens, then we have to know full well that God is in charge of the situation and that he has a purpose for it. And as he said in verse 7, he is righteous. God is righteous in all that he does. We and our kings, our princes, and our ancestors are covered with shame, Lord, because we have sinned against you. The and when you're under a system of obedience versus punishment we are in a hopeless condition because we will all sin and fall short because we are cursed humans in general are cursed and selfish and living in a cursed world full of sin um, and there is no room for mercy in a system that pits obedience versus punishment we would be in constant punishment if our only option for blessing was obedience. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. And I don't think that Daniel's exaggerating here. He says, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Um, even the people who are doing the best they can do and, and trying the hardest, like in Jesus' day, the Pharisees were doing the best that they could do and wanted to be the best that they could be, but yet they, even in their attempts to be the best they could be, they were falling short and <laughs> even being self-righteous and judgmental towards other people. Uh, is a sin. So while trying to be the best you can be, you sin. All Israel has failed.
Therefore the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the word spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing on us great disaster. Under the whole heaven nothing has ever been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. So Daniel has a proper attitude. He's recognizing the failures and shortcomings and sin of all of Israel. And he continues to praise God for his righteousness and uh, keeping his promises. He said he had fulfilled the word spoken against us. So God is faithful and we are sinful. That is the condition of mankind. Especially under a system where if you obey, then you receive blessings. Because we won't obey, we will fail, we will sin. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. The Lord did not hesitate to bring the disaster on us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. Now, Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day. We have sinned. We have done wrong. Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and the iniquities of our ancestors have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. So how many times did Daniel repeat himself and just say, we are wicked and sinful, and God is righteous and faithful. He's repeated himself many times over and over in this prayer. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, our God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. There again, he recognizes he's not righteous, but he's appealing to God, uh, appealing to God's goodness and mercy for forgiveness. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act. For your sake, my God, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. So, it's interesting how Daniel realized that God had pre-appointed a 70-year uh, captivity that began with Nebuchadnezzar. And that time was coming to a close. <clears throat> and yet, he humbles himself and admits sin and failure and begs for mercy. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill. Now, Daniel says that he was confessing his sin and the sin of the people. Uh, you know, Daniel could almost claim righteousness. Uh, I mean... He, we have many examples of him refusing the Lord's portion of food, uh, refusing to worship the king, uh, for him standing by his faith. So, but so Daniel could have taken the position that he was righteous and he did what was right, but all the other people did wrong. But Daniel humbled himself, admitted his own sin and weakness, and he realized that he wasn't just exaggerating or. Uh, saying that he was sinning, but he actually realized his own sin, even though we can look at Daniel and say, wow, he was perfect. He did everything right. Daniel recognized his own sin. While I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you began to pray, a word went out. So that tells me that 
God didn't even have to hear the whole prayer and, and all the many times that Daniel repeated himself about how he and his people had sinned and God is righteous. It says as soon as he began to pray, then Gabriel was sent out uh, to him. Which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. And I would think Daniel's prayer went a little bit long. He repeated himself too many times, almost as if, um, like the Pharisees, thought that by their many words they would be heard. You don't have to repeat yourself over and over and over. Uh, God knows your heart, and uh, you don't have to repeat yourself like I'm doing to prove that you are humble. God knows whether you're humble or not. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to fit. So, seventy sevens. This is a critical uh, prophecy. Seventy sevens, sometimes say weeks, but I think the more literal translation is sevens. Let's see what this says. Four weeks, also verse 25. So, seventy sevens are decreed for your people, which is obviously the Jews. Daniel was a Jew, and his people were the Jews. So 70 sevens are decreed for the Jews, and your holy city, which is obviously Jerusalem. There is an appointed amount of time in regard to the Jews and Jerusalem. Finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. And this says, or the most holy one, uh, which could be Jesus. The most holy one in Jesus, or the most holy place, uh, could be uh, the church. Um, but all these things, there's a pre-appointed amount of time, 70 weeks, 77s regarding the Jews in Jerusalem and what's going to happen is we're going to finish transgression so you would no longer be held accountable to your sins we'll put an end to that put an end to sin uh, to atone for wickedness to make an atonement what was the atonement for sin the atonement for sin was Jesus dying on the cross to bring in everlasting righteousness. We have everlasting righteousness through the blood of Christ and through his mercy and forgiveness of sins. We put on Christ uh, in his righteousness to seal up vision and prophecy. So we're saying when this happens, when Jesus comes and dies on the cross, we're going to seal up vision and prophecy. It's not going to happen anymore. So people uh, want to be modern day prophets. Uh, to tell what's going to happen in our future. But the Bible teaches that when Jesus came and died on the cross to put us end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, he was also going to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the true most holy place, which would be the church, this kingdom that uh, would be established during the Roman Empire that would last forever and ever. For an eternal dominion. The most holy place is the body of Christ. Know and understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. So I think the 77s from verse 24 is 490 years. 70 times 7 is 490. And I believe it's talking about years. And it works out because we're, we're dealing with about uh, 500 B.C. And he's saying in about 500 years, the anointed one is going to come. And there are these uh, divisions. It says seven sevens, but and then sixty-two sevens, and then one seven. So I see the possibility that there are minor gaps in between these weeks of years, 
Um, but a lot of people today think that we had essentially the the first seven sevens and then a sixty two sevens that got us to Jesus, and now we're waiting over two thousand years for the final seven, and that just makes no sense. Why you would have approximately five hundred years uh, determined for the Jews and the Jewish people in Jerusalem, the holy city. Um, and then you want to stretch it out to over 2,500 years. It makes no sense. We're talking about about a 500-year span uh, where all things will be accomplished. And all things were accomplished through Jesus dying on the cross. That was the point of everything, to bring in the everlasting righteousness and kingdom uh, of Christ and mercy and forgiveness of our sins, true atonement through the blood of Christ. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble, after the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be put. All right, so the first seven, it says there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. It will be rebuilt. Jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. So that means 49 years. So in 49 years, after it's... Uh, the command to rebuild Jerusalem and restore Jerusalem, you got 49 years to rebuild in troubled times. And then there's 62 sevens, which is 400 and, I don't know, whatever 62 times 7 is, uh, years to wait for the anointed one to be put to death. Jesus put to death on the cross. And then I kind of feel that that last seven was around 70 A.D. So you've got a period of years where the Jerusalem is rebuilt in troublesome times. Then you've got a longer period of just waiting for the Messiah to come. And then you've got that final seven uh, when... <laughs> Jerusalem is destroyed again. Jerusalem and the temple that was rebuilt would be destroyed again. It says you've got about 500 years, 490 years appointed for the Jews in Jerusalem. And it all came to a head in the first century. And we're dealing with about, we're starting at about 500 BC. Put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. So who came and destroyed Jerusalem and the temple? It was the Romans, which is still what we had been talking about in the book of Daniel leading up to this point. During the Roman Empire, uh, the kingdom of Christ is going to come in and have dominion over the world for all eternity, forever and ever, during the Roman Empire. And the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the temple in 70 A.D., so to me, it's obviously talking about that. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end. So the end of what? It's the end of the age, the end of the Jewish age, the age that they are currently living in. And desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. So what happened how would you put an end to sacrifice and offering? It's by destroying the temple. It's impossible to have sacrifice and offering if you don't have an altar or a temple to offer the sacrifices in. So in the middle of the final seven, the middle of the final seven years, which would be three and a half years, the temple would be destroyed. It was destroyed in 70 AD. So the final week... The final seven started around 66 A.D., and then after three and a half years, the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D., and that final three and a half years of the Jewish world ended by 73 A.D. It was completely destroyed and put away. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation 
until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. So the abomination of desolation. Jesus references the abomination of desolation. Let me go find it. All right, it's in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. Jesus said, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So, in Matthew chapter 24, is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. He's warning people about the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And he says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, right here in Daniel chapter 9, when you see it standing in the temple, you better go to the mountains because the temple is about to be destroyed. And if you stand there, you'll be destroyed with it. So there's a lot of debate about this, and I don't have the exact dates worked out uh, for when the command was given to rebuild Jerusalem, and uh, but it works out very close. You just have to figure out whether it's this start date or that start date and how the calendar changed over the years and whether you uh, count 360 days a year or 365. Uh, it's a little technical, but it's very close. You say uh, 490 years from the command to restore Jerusalem to when the Jesus when the Messiah comes when Jesus dies on the cross he puts an end to sin uh, he brings in everlasting righteousness uh, he atones for sin he's cut off uh, and in the middle of the final week uh, sacrifice and offering will be no more it all works out you go from the 5th century B.C. to the 1st century A.D. It's about 500 years, 490 years. And it's talking about Jesus coming, establishing his eternal kingdom, and the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and the Jewish way of life. I appreciate any comments you've got. Hopefully they are productive.